<laughs> Maybe a few floors yeah. above us. Um, yeah. So, yeah, is it everything ready? I think so, yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay, perfect. So. Oh. I'm scared of uh, can you Can you see? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Alex. Perfect. Hello. Hello. So. All right, so I'll, I share my so, screen. Yeah, if you can, please. I think I can. We'll see. Do you see? Yeah, we do, we do, we do. So well, All right. our Zoom speaker, <laughs> Zoom, but close Zoom speaker of today is Alexander <laughs> Stewart. And he comes from the University of St. Andrews. And he's going to talk about models for the onset and resolution of affective polarization. So the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, sorry I'm not down there in person. I have been feeling very unwell last night and this morning, and I was worried I had COVID. I do not, I should emphasize, um, but I'm nonetheless not feeling great. So I figured it was probably better for everyone if I stay up here and talk to you um, from a distance. So yeah, I'm going to talk about some modeling work that I've done um, with some collaborators looking at um, the relationship between polarization and inequality. So why talk about polarization as a workshop in inequality? Um, to some extent, we've already answered that question. We've had other talks that discussed polarization in some depth, and I don't think it's necessarily a sort of counterintuitive idea that polarization and inequality should be linked. But I do just want to flag up one, one strand of the empirical case for the relationship, which is shown in the figure here. Can people see my mouse, by the way? Yeah, yes, great, okay. So this is taken from um, Nolan McCarty's book, Polarization, What Everyone Needs to Know. And the models I'm gonna show you are done in collaboration with Nolan and some other people. Although of course, the usual caveat applies that anything that sucks about them is my fault, not theirs. Um, but what this figure here shows is in red, we have the degree of polarization in the United States over the course of the century from 1917 to 2017. Um, polarization here is elite polarization. It's measured using the DW nominate metric, which captures the extent to which political parties in Congress are polarized. And plotted against it are both the Gini coefficients in the United States in blue, and the um, income share of the top 1% of taxpayers in green. And what you see is that both polarization by these um, by this DW nominate measure and inequality by these two um, similar measures follow a U-shaped distribution in the United States over the course of that century. Um, now, of course, just because two things trend in the same direction doesn't mean they're causally related, but it is very suggestive, especially because there's good a priori reasons to think that polarization and inequality should interact with each other. So what is what could be the causal relationship between polarization and inequality? Well, inequality may cause polarization by exacerbating tensions between groups with different levels of wealth. Polarization may increase inequality by preventing redistributive policy. Um, when polarization leads to legislative deadlock, as arguably it has in the United States over the past decades, Reversing it may become a necessary but not sufficient condition for tackling high levels of inequality. So the work I'm going to show you is trying to unpack this relationship, the dynamics that arise from this interaction between inequality, inequality and polarization using um, mathematical and computational models. The work I'm going to present is based mostly on these two papers and um, which if you want to, I'm obviously not going to have time to go into infinite detail here. So if you want to get into the details of these models, I, I very much encourage you to look and of course cite these papers. Um, and I'm not going to show, oh yeah, I'm not going to show a great deal of data here because although I emphasized in my introduction, uh, uh, introducing myself and my research that I'm very keen on connecting mechanistic models to data, um, the data side of it is still sort of ongoing. And so I will talk about future plans, but not really any many results along those lines. So my talk is going to be split into three parts, time permitting. In the first part, I'm going to talk about models of mass polarization. And in particular, I'm going to focus on effective polarization um, as um, 
instantiated in a, as a form of loss of cooperation. And then I'm going to talk about the relationship between risk aversion, identity, and sorting. And I'll explain what, what those terms mean in this context in a moment. In part two, I'm going to talk about the relationship between inequality and polarization. I'm going to show that polarization can be sticky under some fairly simple assumptions and that when it is and that polarization can exacerbate the effects of inequality and then finally i'm going to talk about the bit that everybody always asks when you talk about these models is all right so what what does that tell us about how we fix polarization and i'm going to talk about redistribution as a preventative but not corrective measure for fixing polarization and then i'm going to show briefly some new results on how we can use heterogeneity and influence to um a modeling a modeling of good behavior as a way to potentially reverse um, polarization. So polarization in public discourse tends to refer nebulously to a wide range of interconnected phenomena. We talk about polarization a lot, but we don't necessarily, obviously in this audience we do, but in, in general discourse, we don't necessarily pin down exactly what we mean. And so I'm going to th talk about polarization and think about polarization in at least three interrelated but distinct ways. The first way is I'm going to refer to a sorting, which is clustering of people into competing groups, typically aligned with a political identity. Antagonism between identity groups. So this is known as effective polarization and is usually measured by asking, for example, in the US case, Republicans and Democrats to rate their attitudes towards the political outgroup and their political in-group on a zero to 100 feelings thermometer and looking at the difference between those two numbers. Um, and when the difference between those two numbers is, is large, that means you like your in-group a lot and you dislike your out-group a lot. And then, of course, the sense of polarization, which we saw in the first slide, in which distinct clusters of policy preferences um, arise in a group or population, and I refer to this as ideological polarization. So obviously all of those things interact with each other, but they are also clearly distinct. And of course, <coughs> it's also important to talk about who we're interested in being polarized. So this could we could talk about mass polarization, i.e. voters as opposed to political elites, um, or we could talk about elites. And so in this talk, I'm going to focus mainly on mass polarization, and I'm mainly going to focus on effective polarization and sorting, and I'm going to defer um, the, 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 any discussion of um, elite polarization and ideological polarization um, to discussion or, or to another time. And what we're particularly going to be interested in trying to capture in these models and what originally motivated these models is how things like inequality and more generally this term economic anxiety, which is not a great term, but it's a commonly used term, how these, this kind of idea of economic anxiety can lead to polarization. Um, we're going to conceptualize polarization for the purposes of this talk as willingness to cooperate with political in versus out group. So we're going to be interested in the population dynamics of polarized attitudes. So we're inherently adopting um, a mechanistic worldview here, i.e. we're thinking that ideas and attitudes emerge and spread in a population through a process that is less than rational, i.e. we're thinking of the spread of polarization as something more like an epidemiological process as opposed to a decision theoretic rational, rational process. And the mechanism of spread that we're going to focus on for the purposes of these models is utility-based social learning. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean something relatively simple. We're going to assume that social learning occurs through observing and imitating others, and that um, payoff-based or utility-based imitation occurs according to this function, where the probability that um, um, a player I imitates player J's strategy is equal to one over one plus e to the sigma wi minus wj, where wi and wj are the utilities of the respective players, and sigma is a global parameter that basically controls the strength of selection or the amount of noise in the imitation process. So it's not super important that you, I'm not going to dwell on the details of the math, but it is, I think, useful for people who are familiar with these models to just see what we're assuming. And the key thing that we're going to assume about the utility function is that it is nonlinear and S-shaped, and that the and that it is and that utility of all individuals in the population arises both from their interactions, their cooperative 
or not interactions with other people, and also from some sort of underlying state of the environment. So utility arises from multiple social interactions with during a given period of time, and also the underlying economic environments. And we assume that it follows qualitatively the form shown in this figure, where when the underlying environment is, is bad, when you're down here, where my cursor is, then your utility is low. And as the underlying environment increases, utility increases. And what the effect that this has is that when you are, when the underlying environment is very good, you're sort of risk neutral. So you don't, you, know, you neither risk tolerant or nor risk averse. But as you start to approach this cliff here where your utility decreases rapidly with the underlying environments, you become risk averse. And then as you get down close to zero, you become risk tolerant. So that's just to do with the curvature of the utility function. But this assumption that you the level of risk aversion that a population feels varies with the underlying environment is key for studying this question of how so-called economic anxiety and inequality interact with polarization in our model. So that's the utility. So I said utility arises from a combination of the underlying environment and from social interactions occurring between members of the population. So we're going to assume that these social interactions take the form of cooperative cooperation in which individuals choose whether to interact with members of their in-group or members of their out-group with a probability P. And if they do choose to interact with a member of their in-group, then the success of that interaction, uh, that, sorry, that interaction is successful with a probability QI to generate a benefit BI, and it fails with probability one minus QI. And for outgroup interactions, the probability of success is different, it's QO, and the benefit that you generate is QO. And in particular, what we assume is that when you choose to engage in outgroup interactions, um, those interactions are more risky, but more beneficial. So why do we assume that? Well, this is basically an a priori assumption that we assume to capture the idea that polarization can, in principle, be generated by risk aversion, by economic anxiety. So in order for a risk aversion to generate high levels of polarization, i.e. to generate a high level of interactions with in-groups as opposed to out-groups, you need to assume something like this. You need to assume that out-group interactions are perceived as more risky or are, in fact, more risky than in-group interactions. And then, so the level of polarization in our model is measured by via this parameter P, which is the each individual in the population strategy. And we also make an additional assumption that in order for an outgroup interaction to successfully occur, both players have to be willing to participate in it, i.e. if polarization is equal to or close to one um, for all members of the population, then even if one individual decides to try not being polarized, they won't get anywhere because other members of the population are not willing to interact with them. So I've thrown a lot of information at you. I hope it's not too confusing, but this is the basic setup of the model, which I just wanted to give you a sense of before I start to move on to some of the results. Um, I guess I'm going to skip over um, the, the additional mathematical descriptions here because I want to get to the actual um, things that we find, but we we have this utility function, which I showed you before, and we we uh, parameterize it um, in a particular way that depends both on the underlying environment and the benefits that arise from these social interactions that I just described to you. And then a particular individual's utility depends on their strategy. An individual I has a utility WI that depends on their strategy PI and the probabilities of success and failure of interactions and of this utility function F. And I'm not going to belabor that because I don't really have time to go into it. So the basic thing to understand about this model is that if most players have high levels of polarization, meaning P is equal to one or close to one, interactions will tend to remain within group. And that means that polarization is high because people don't attempt to cooperate with people outside of their political in-group. If most players have a low level of polarization, P equals zero, that means interactions occur commonly between groups, and we think of polarization as being low. And what we want to study is the population dynamics of this level of polarization, P, under different underlying environments, theta. So these social learning models are it's, it's stochastic and complicated to analyze, and we use a combination of agent-based modeling and adaptive dynamics to do so. Um, I'm, again, I'm not going to belabor that, but I can return to it in the discussion if people are interested. 
But what we find when we carry out this analysis that combines um, sort of adaptive dynamics analysis, if that means anything to anyone, and um, agent-based modeling. Can yes. I ask a question just to clarify? So when yes. you uh, imitate, you copy also P? Yeah, you copy P. That's exactly right. So the, okay. the imitation process is the copying of another player's strategy. And in this context, you call it's it's P. And I realize now that my notation is actually bad because I also use P to mean the probability of copying. Sorry about that. Um, but yes, you copy P. Okay. Great. Okay. So now, now what we can do is look at the the dynamics of the the polarization, the level of polarization P in the whole population as a function of the underlying, which we call this the economic environment theta. And so at the top, on the, if you look at this figure on the right, you see, this is a, a sort of phase diagram. Um, I've, I've labeled roughly the regions where the um, underlying utility function is risk tolerance, risk averse or risk neutral respectively. And what you see is that if you're in the risk neutral um, region, you have bi stability where both low um, polarization and high polarization is um, is stable. So if you initialize your population in this white region here where my cursor is, P will evolve down to zero. If you initialize it in the blue region, P will evolve up to one. Similarly, in the risk tolerant regime, you see that um, there's a there's bi stability. There's a very small region uh, under these parameters in which if you start just up here where my cursor is, um, P will evolve to high levels of polarization. If you start in this big white region, you'll evolve to low levels of polarization. However, if you're in the risk averse region, the bi-stability disappears and you only evolve towards, and I'm using evolve here to mean population dynamics change over time. You only evolve towards P equals one, i.e. you only ever evolve to high levels of polarization. There's no longer any bi-stability. Why is that important? Well, it's important because if we consider a time varying economic environment, so here in this figure at the bottom, we have theta, the economic underlying environment varying sort of sigmoidally. Um, so initially the environment is good, so we're risk tolerant. And if we initialize our population, this is the, this is the level of polarization as a result of agent-based simulations. If we initialize our population, in the basin of attraction for low polarization, you tend to stay there until the environment becomes sufficiently bad that you end up in the risk um, averse regime, in which case you tend to evolve towards high levels of polarization. <clears throat> and when you the system, um, when so when theta goes back up to high levels of um, um, this, to, to being a good environment again, you don't go back to the low levels of polarization because of this bi stability. So you start off down here, say, but then the environment gets worse. So then you end up following this arrow up here. And then when the environment improves again, you're still up here stuck in the bi stuck in the high levels of polarization um, due to the bi stability. And so what you see in this model is first of all, that polarization can arise from um, ec essentially economic anxiety from risk aversion um, in certain in, uh, underlying environmental states. And the polarization is sticky in the sense that once it emerges in the population, it doesn't disappear when the environment improves again. And so this is obviously bad, but um, I think sort of a, an interesting um, hypothesis about the nature, it generates an interesting hypothesis about the nature of polarization and the relationship between things like economic anxiety mm -hmm. and polarization. Okay, so, so far we've, may implicitly made some very simplistic assumptions about the nature of identity, in particular that political in-groups and political out-groups are the only feature of identity that matters and that people make their decisions about who to cooperate with based on political identities. This is obviously not reasonable uh, and not a reasonable account um, of reality and it doesn't allow us to study other forms of polarization than effective polarization such as sorting which as I mentioned is the sort of alignment between political identities and other forms of identity. So in order to capture this we um, made our model more complicated and allowed um, identities to be multi-dimensional such that in-groups encompass multiple facets of identity possibly including political party, but also including other features of identity that are not to do with politics, could be race, religion, um, et cetera. 
And what we study is, and we assume rather, that an individual strategy is not only their willingness to interact with outgroups, so there's probability P, but also their political identity. So we allow them to both switch political identity and to switch their willingness to interact with outgroups. Now, this gets rather complicated, so I'm not going to go into it in detail, but I do just want to flag up one particular result that we get when we once we make this complicated, more complicating assumption. So we keep fixed um, group identities such as race or religion, allow party identities to change over time, and we look at how um, both the level of sorting, i.e. the alignment between fixed features of identity and political identity, change alongside the degree of effective polarization, i.e. the willingness to cooperate with outgroups. And what we find is that in all of the regimes, um, risk tolerant, risk averse, or risk neutral, the, we'll, we will see ev evolution of high levels of sorting, which is given. So the, here in all of these three figures, we're showing um, the, the, tr the possible trajectories that the population can undergo. The red dots indicate stable equilibria. And so you see that sorting, uh, i.e. the alignment between fixed forms of identity and political identity reaches high levels. It's symmetrical because you, we, we don't assume any particular bias in one way or the other. Um, and we also see we get this bi-stability in the risk tolerance and risk neutral regimes. Why is this important? Well, the reason it's important is that it suggests, and I don't really have time to go into the details of this, but I'd be happy to discuss it with you, um, is that as political identity becomes more salient in decision making at the expense of other forms of identity, um, what that means is that we will see increased levels of sorting um, along such that political identities align with um, other forms of identity. And that is precisely what we see in the United States over the course of more or less the last century, depending, depending on which of these figures you're looking at. So here, what we are showing is the degree of racial polarization as measured by, um, on the left here, as measured by um, the same kind of feelings thermometer type questions that define effective polarization. So you ask people their opinions about racial outgroups. And this is specifically showing the responses for white people in the United States about other racial outgroups over the course of, of sort of like 1960 to 2020. And we see that the expressed level of polarization, racial polarization in this sense is decreasing over time, but at the same time, effective polarization is increasing and the degree of sorting, i.e. the tendency of race to align with per political identity is also increasing. And so what this suggests is that we're seeing political identity becoming more salient in the way that people think about themselves and think about others. That's leading to greater levels of sorting. And rather than actually seeing, or whilst if you just looked at the left-hand figure, this would suggest a sort of positive worldview in which the world is becoming less racially polarized, what we think is actually happening here is that um, racial political identity is becoming a proxy for race, essentially. And so the effective polarization is a sort of more acceptable way of expressing um, racial dislike, which is great. Um, OK. So I've talked a lot about polarization and sorting, effective polarization and sorting. Um, but this is a workshop on inequality. So what about the relationship between polarization and inequality. So we go, what we're going to do now is take the same basic model that I've described to you, again, rather quickly, and we're going to instantiate the idea of inequality by assuming that different subgroups of the population experience different underlying environments theta. And we're also, in order to study um, the relationship between polarization, inequality, and redistribution, we're going to also assume that there's a possibility of redistribution via public goods at rate alpha, such that the group um, in the, if we increase the amount of redistribution, we, we improve the environments of the people experiencing the worst underlying worst underlying environments and make and decrease the uh, um, economic environment of the people in the good environment. So the first question we want to ask is, is this kind of inequality sufficient to generate polarization in our model? And secondly, we want to ask, can redistribution make things better? And I'm sort of <laughs> giving away the answer to the first question by asking the second, yes, inequality can generate polarization in our model. And then we're gonna ask, can redistribution make things better? 
So to capture this idea of inequality and redistribution, we assume that the underlying economic environment, um, theta depends on, um, a, a, I'm, again, I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but happy to discuss later, um, a redistribution from these cooperative interactions between members of the population, um, plus a baseline environment, theta zero, or minus a baseline environment, theta zero. <clears throat> so what we're doing, what we then do here in this figure is compare the, first of all, on the left, the level of polarization evolving over time in a scenario where there's inequality in the sense that some people experience a bad environment and some people experience a good environment. Um, and we're comparing this to a scenario which has the same average environment, but everybody faces the same, you know, if everybody gets the same theta. And what we see is that polarization under inequality tends to evolve to high levels and much higher levels than we see when there is no inequality. And even more striking, if we look at the effects on utility under our model is, so if you look on the left here, initially where the difference in utility between the high quality environment and the good quality environment, the red and the blue lines is very small, but as polarization increases, the people in the low quality environments get increasingly low levels of utility, whilst the people in the red environments end up once we reach equilibrium, having kind of the same level of utility as they had to start with, and the population average utility in the unequal environment versus the same versus the same average environment where there is no inequality has lower average utility. So the effect of inequality here um, is to increase polarization, and the effect of polarization is to increase the the manifested effects of inequality as understood through utility under this model. And so this is capturing the idea of this feedback loop between inequality and utility as inequality and polarization, where inequality exacerbates polarization and polarization exacerbates inequality. Of course, there are other mechanisms for this, but I think this is nonetheless an interesting way of looking at it in the space of mass polarization or effective polarization. So the way this happens, just to give you a little bit of intuition, is that the um, people in the low quality environment um, are, uh, experience essentially a risk averse environment, which leads them to adopt, start adopting high polarized strategies. But because of this process of social learning, this quickly spreads to the whole population, even though the people in the high quality environment are not really advantaged by adopting a risk averse attitude because they're fine. And so you get this same kind of dynamic that we saw previously, where once polarization takes hold, it becomes sticky um, and it's not easy to reverse. And this can happen if only a subset of the population become risk averse or economically anxious or whatever you want to call it. Okay, so I have literally no idea how I'm doing for time, by the way, because I'm sick and I'm confused. So people should please shout at me if I'm going on too long. Um, so I finally want to talk about the thing that I, I guess is the sort of important point. So what lessons can we take from this kind of modeling um, for fixing polarization? And, and what are we going to do in the future to try and understand, um, address these questions better using these kinds of models? So the first thing I want to note is that sufficient levels of redistribution, um, meaning high levels of this parameter alpha that I mentioned before, can prevent the onset of polarization in the low quality risk averse environment. So if we, have an, if we have an initially unequal environment, but we engage in redistribution such that environments become more equal between the two groups, we see that as we, oh, we missed an N off the axis there, but as we increase the level of redistribution alpha, inequality declines and polarization declines and the average utility of the population increases in response. So that's really kind of to be expected, right? If we, I already showed you that if you start off with the same average environment without inequality, you get less polarization than if you assume that one group has a worse environment than the other. <coughs> Just a side note that if we include um, some form of deadweight loss due to taxation in our public goods um, model, then this makes um, reducing polarization and um, notably harder to do. So here on the left, we see that um, re increasing redistribution does decrease inequality by, uh, by necessity, but it doesn't do such a good job at reducing polarization when there is this dead weight loss due to taxation. But that's a, that's a bit of a side note, but again, happy to discuss towards the end. So this redistribution is sufficient to um, prevent the onset of polarization in our model, but it is not sufficient to 
reverse polarization because polarization is sticky. And essentially the only way to reverse polarization under this model is to knock the population out of the basin of attraction for high polarized behavior, high polarized strategies. <clears throat> One thing that's sort of neat here um, in this model is that it sort of built, it, it, what, what emerges from it is the idea that um, a, a so-called you know, shock and economic shock or some kind of other shock that uh, such as a war or something, which vastly decreases the utility of the population can actually be effective in reducing polarization. And you can see this, this figure isn't ideal for the points I want to make, but I didn't have time to make a better one. So here we have the baseline environment, theta zero on the x-axis, and the color indicates the size of the basin of attraction of polarization. So where the darker the color, the harder it is to reverse polarization. And if the baseline environment becomes bad enough, then you it, the basin of attraction for pol high polarization becomes sufficiently small that it's pretty easy to escape it and generate low polarization in the population. And so if I just very quickly zoom back to this figure, that basically what I'm saying is if the environment theta goes from kind of here, you're up here at high polarization and the environment theta goes down here, it's very easy to escape this basin of attraction because it's so small. So that's one way of escaping um, polarization. You, or the, In our model, the only way of escaping polarization is to um, knock the population out of the basin of attraction for high levels of polarization. And you can try to enact policies which essentially shrink the, um, the, the size of the basin of attraction for high levels of polarization. One way um, that you can try to generate this kind of knocking the population out of the basin of attraction for high polarization is via so-called coordinated efforts in which um, you get enough people to start being unpolarized that um, the basically you, 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 you escape the, the basin of attraction for high levels of polarization. How could you do that? Well, one way you could do that is by having elites who model good behavior. And so we've started recently to um, look at the idea of, of influence inequality in where, which the population has people with heterogeneous levels of influence such that people with high influence will tend to be copied by people with low influence but will not tend to copy people with low influence. And we show that this can be actually quite successful. And again, I apologize for the no bad notation here. I repeated the use of gamma. Um, but the way to read this heat map is that when the proportion of low influence individuals becomes high enough and when the relative influence of the high influence individuals is high enough then the um then you will end up getting low levels of polarization i.e you you so in the blue region you tend to get you tend to be able to successfully reverse polarization quickly and in the yellow region you tend to be able to not reverse polarization quickly and so what this is showing is that it is possible to model good behavior and push these dynamics out of the bad basin of attraction of high polarization, provided the group of low high influence individuals is small enough and that their levels of influence are big enough. Okay, so finally, I just wanted to say a couple of notes about where we're going next with this work. So um, we obviously haven't presented very much data here uh, connected to this model, and I would like to correct that. So one thing that we're looking at doing um, and we're piloting a version of this, but it's not yet connected to polarization. But what we're doing is um, <laughs> carrying out multi-scale public goods games in which individuals have to choose whether to invest in their local group or in a global group in this figure. It's called Westville, Eastburg, and Allshire. Um, so it's a regular public goods game where people invest if, oh, so yeah, so it's a threshold public goods game, excuse me. If enough people invest, then everybody gets a payoff within the group, be it Allshire, Westville, or Eastburg, or of course, people can choose to defect and keep the coin. What we want to do with polarization, of course, is to make these groups aligned with people's political identity and make the degree of that political identity sufficiently salient, um, or, or vary the degree of salience of that political identity in order to see how that affects their willingness to engage in um, cooperation at different scales. We're also measuring the extent to which people identify with different groups, be it their in-group, their out-group, or the whole group using the dynamic identity fusion index. And again, that will be interesting to look at when the different populations, different subgroups are divided according to um, uh, political identity. Um, okay, 
And that's all I have to say. I hope that wasn't too confusing. As I say, I'm a little sick, so I, I don't, not totally sure whether what I said made sense, but hopefully there's some interesting stuff there and I'm happy to discuss. Um, I'd like to thank my collaborators and my funders, and especially, as I said at the start, Nolan McCarty, who is a political scientist and who is sort of the, why, I, why I'm <laughs> happy to work on, on this, um, because I have a political scientist to talk to who, who's willing to sort of like keep me grounded and, and not wander off into a weird model world that doesn't connect to reality. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so, well, there are a few questions, so I keep track of you. Oh. Okay, uh, thank you, really great talk, great work. I, I, now I realize I read uh, some of your papers and I really was very impressed by your work, so cool stuff. Um, yeah, I've actually two questions, um, if I may. <laughs> Um, the first one is, um, so it's in, in, in the model uh, you, you presented, a very crucial assumption is that if people, let's say, from a low-income group interact with people from a high-income group, that is a risky thing, uh, to, uh, and it's even more risky if there's more inequality. Um, and, and how does that relate uh, to, say, also the, the economic benefits that you get, uh, particularly in an unequal society, <laughs> if you uh, get the chance to interact. So say you are poor and you get the chance to work uh, uh, for an employer uh, who is rich. Uh, so you have a job, you make uh, an earning uh, <coughs> as compared to, uh, and, and you are better off than other poor people who don't have a job and don't make an earning. So that's a positive interaction, say, mm -hmm. with a rich outgroup member. So there must be somehow a trade-off, somehow a balance uh, or, or a trade-off between these things. And I wonder how that figures into your uh, modeling. Yeah, um, it's, it's really interesting, yeah. actually. So in the initial model, um, we don't assume that the, so what I was showing you here, we don't assume that these groups are un unequal in wealth. Mm. We just assume that they having different identities is perceived or, or for some reason is in fact more risky. Now, this is sort of why I got into the, identity sorting stuff because what we assume is that different the, the wealth does not like inherently vary with political identity but it may vary with other fa facets of identity and then and so if what happens is sorting i.e political identity align with other facets of identity then you end up with a scenario like you describe in which um you have a, a wealthy group is the, is perceived as the out group and a non wealthy group is perceived as the in group. So <clears throat> that doesn't answer your question, but that's just to clarify the model. Yeah. Um, so the, the I, I guess I think that the there's a that what we've assumed is very simplistic. There is there are some interesting studies that show, for example, um how people's attitude vary when hiring someone from a different identity group. So there is evidence, for example, that people are, you know, engage in racial bias in hiring and that sort of thing. And I think that speaks to what you're describing. If it's literally the case that there's just a rich group and a poor group, like everybody in one group is rich and everyone in one group is poor, I don't think, I think you're right and you wouldn't sort of have this risk aversion. That we're assuming but i think if on average one group is rich but the, both groups are heterogeneous then what we're sort of assuming is that people within a given identity group who are rich will give the opportunities to the people with who, or who share their identity and they will perceive giving an opportunity to someone in the poorer group who also has a different identity as risky does that make sense uh, yeah i think so yeah, yeah. maybe short second no okay I'll say, okay where should no, I save it for later. I save it for later. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm going to ask you something, Andrew. I mean, would you feel okay just having one more question, taking a break now, and then continuing later? Would it be okay for you? Or, yeah? That's, Can that's, you, like, that's connect? Fine for me. Yes, like, I, I, may, I may even talk to her and later, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying it because, I mean, well, also for logistic reasons. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's, then, that's since then we have fine, more yes. discussion. So... Just one more question. You can take a break and rest a little, and then we come okay, back. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah? Okay, so one more, yeah, just like, and, and so Eduardo, and then...
Hi, Alexander. I just need to talk enough that the camera focus on me here. So thank you for the talk. So in particular, going through these distinctions about polarizations, I always found that very confusing. I learned a lot. And that's uh, my question, just to see if I understand. Because it, the identities you had were always a binary decision or a discrete set of options. So while I could think about examples where the opinion or a stance on a political issue could be better modeled by maybe a, a real variable, I just want to, to clarify from you whether this is uh, indeed a different type of, of uh, problem or, uh, or you can map this to the things you did. And if it is a different type, whether you think that is uh, uh, different dynamics or if that aspect is relevant or uh, the discreteness is not important Yeah, Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think the discreteness is important and it's sort of important for the definition of sorting. Um, it's, it's, um, I don't, so that isn't to say that you can't have sorting along lines of continuous identity, um, just as you can have, um, sort of bimodal policy preferences when policy preferences are continuous, but that require that is obviously much more complex to model and we haven't done it yet, but I think that you're right that it's an important thing to think about. And actually, one of the things I'm very interested in doing, which is semi-related, is to connect these kinds of models more explicitly to both opinion dynamics of the type that we heard about in some of the previous talks, and also a, a more sort of nuanced model of identity dynamics itself. So where, where its identity is continuous and where you can feel more or less um, attuned to a particular identity um, in response to both your opinion and your like, economic environment and all that sort of thing. So I think it's a really important point, but I don't really have a lot of intuition about how it will change the results at this point. Yes, it's more of a reminder, but then we'll come back for the discussion. So just before the, uh, so let's perhaps thanks again, uh, Alex, for the...